Born July 4, 1953, Shahini Elizabeth Fakuri's ideals and faith were rooted in her upbringing in the tiny rustic community of Claremont in St. Anne. She was bounded by strong traditions of family, self-help, charitable work, and personal truthfulness. I'm from St. Anne. My mother only went to Kingston to <laughs> deliver, it's deliver me as a baby, to have me as a baby. But I, I went to school in Kingston, but I've spent most of my adult life in St. Anne. She graduated from the Immaculate Conception High School before attending the Miami-Dade College in Florida. Staying close to her roots, she got married and settled in St. Anne. I'm a reader. Um, I'm not a movie person. I, I watch PBC though. Even, <laughs> even the other day when I was, when I, I, I had major surgery and I was out of commission, uh, I watched you know, a lot at that time. Family meant everything to her. I don't have any biological children, but I raised five boys. The five boys that she re referred to were Richie, Ruan, Johnny, Ken Ken, and Bo. Um, and they, they, all were somehow still, uh, you know, in touch with her by the time she passed away. Um, we played with all of them as kids or uh, even now, like the other day, Bull and, and my husband planted a tree for her. I grew up with my, with the boys that she raised, which um, they were persons who worked with her basically on the farm, but she mothered them. She treated them just like how she treated us. So when we went on beach outings, they were there. So it was like a, a family setting with, with everybody present. And we had a lot of learning experience based on those, those outings and stuff. Um, she was the first person who taught me how to eat a guinep. And I can tell you, when she gave me the first guinep, I chewed it up with the skin, seed, everything. And everybody was laughing at me so hard. She got sorry for me and then she showed me that you cannot eat the skin. And she cracked the, the, the guinea. She took out the seed, she cracked it in her mouth and then placed it in my mouth for me to eat it. So simple experiences like, like knowing different fruits and knowing different places in the island. And Shahini was the person who gave me those experiences. She would bring all the kids to the beach. So it would be like me and my cousins, my brothers and sisters, so like five of us, and then the, our neighbor's kids and the pastor's kids, and all of us are gone to the beach with Auntie Shahini, one woman this big, and like all of us, all these kids. So we go there, and I remember the glass bottom boat, and, and, and you know, it's five dollars for each. And I go to her and I'm like, Auntie Shahini, we want to go on the glass bottom boat. And she's like, how much is it? And I tell her five dollars. She's like, each? I say, yes. She's like, no, here's five dollars. Go see what you can do. <laughs> and to this day, I think my negotiation skills and my everything has changed. Like my communication style, you know, everything has changed because I had to talk to the guy that day about putting all of us on the boat for five dollars and it happened it actually worked and i mean that's what it is is that she empowers everyone like she makes you think that nothing is impossible like you can actually do it and you can rely on yourself to do it so as much as she would help like she's there to help you know but she's also i think her role supporting and pushing empowering people was even more like, I, I don't know, that was my experience. My fondest memory, and I can tell you, when I went to Knox College, we went home on third weekends, based on how the, the schedule is set up. And she was the person that picked us up from school. And I want to let you know that she was the person who attended all our fun days, attended our sports days, attended our parent teachers meetings. She was the person there like a mother for all of us. But this particular third weekend, I was in the grandstand as I normally would be, sitting and waiting for her to pick me up. And a couple of my friends, their students were there, sitting with me waiting to see who would pick me up. And they also had a second motive. They wanted to see what type of vehicle picked you up. 
So they were waiting with me and it was getting late the evening and I was wondering, wow, because in those times they didn't have access to phones as you do now. So I couldn't call and say, Auntie Shaini, where are you? So I had to just wait. Waiting there now and I said, you see, getting it. I said, I wonder if Auntie Shaheen forgot me. But I know she has never done in the past, so why would she forget me? No. And I was there waiting. And when it was getting close to, to dusk, it was getting dark, I heard a helicopter coming in the distance. And I was saying, hmm, funny. I wonder where that, that helicopter going. Then I sat there and I waited. The helicopter came and landed on the football field at Knox College. When I was looking there and I was wondering, you know, but I felt a good feeling. I felt like she would pull a stunt like this one day. When I looked, who jumped out of the front of the helicopter? My Auntie Shaheeni. <laughs> and she came for me, so I just had to run. She came, she ran over to the side of the field and she told me that, go and get your weekend bag. I grabbed my, my knapsack, ran to the dorm, grabbed my weekend bag, and I went home in a helicopter. You know how that was. Everybody was just so impressed. I said, guys, that's my ride. That's my ride there. <laughs> Then um, on Monday morning, she brought me back in the helicopter. Monday morning, she would normally take me back on a Sunday, but she knows the, the effects of, of coming to school in a helicopter. So she made it a point of duty for me to arrive a little bit late on the Monday. And she carried me back and landed in the football field again, of course, with a, with a pilot in the helicopter. And it disrupted school. Everybody ran out of classes and surrounded the field to see who, who came in this helicopter. And I jumped out with my weekend bag again and went to the dorm. So you know that my, my game was up to an ante based on that. And she was the person who gave me that experience and is one that my friends and everybody who remember me from high school remember that. Remember the guy that came in a helicopter and she, she gave me that experience. I can tell you that just her just our dealings and our relationship has taught me to be very brave and to take life by the horns, basically. Take the bull by its horns because um, she has taught us that you won't get through being a wimp. <laughs> you won't get through being weak. So if you notice, my sisters, my brother and I, we have very strong personalities, what people call type A personalities. All of us are as I say, Bull Bucker and Duffy Conqueror. We are strong people and that is due to my aunt and how she raised us. The church was a major influence in her childhood and played a major role in the way she conducted her life. She is firm in her, in her Christian faith. She knows the Bible from cover to cover and she can pull a Bible verse out of her hat for any situation. <laughs> Mind you, I'm not as versed today with the pulling of Bible verses, but I am strong in, in faith, in my Christian faith as well. And it's all because of the, the strong teaching and grounding that she has given us growing up with that faith. The church was very important in her life. Um, God, God was like the supreme for her. Um, if we ever had any troubles or anything, she talked to us a lot about praying and uh, she would quote scriptures to us as well. She was an Anglican, but because she was so involved in the community and did so much with all of the, the people and their own denominations, she went to their church services as well. So she attended all the different churches. She knew what they tend to do, how much praise and worship, which uh, hymns. She, like, it was as if it was all in her head. Like, there was never, she didn't buck shuffle. Like, me, when I go, I might know, like, two lines and then I'm like reading and hoping I catch the melody and whatever not her she could do it all like herself like because she had attended and she took an interest so yeah she was very good at pulling out Bible verses for like every situation it's just it was incredible like it was just like how how are you doing this and she but she was always with her Bible um, no matter where she was, there was a Bible somewhere that she was reading all the time. I've been criticized for attending too many funerals and too many night nights, but um, the book of, I, I make no excuse for that because the book of Romans tells you that when the people rejoice, you must rejoice with them and when they weep, you must weep with them. Satisfied to serve family and community, 
she had no plans to enter representational politics. Representational politics wasn't her focus at all. Like she did just end up there. But she was always like a big community person anyway. So like when people talk about, oh my gosh, how kind and helpful she was in politics. It's like, yeah, she definitely was. Um, and she was cognizant that, that it gave her the way and the platform to help more people. But she was always helping people my entire life. Um, she's, she was in politics for what, the last 19 years, which means that she got in it like when she's 49. I mean, there's a whole lifetime that took place before. Um, and she was always very helpful. All the people in the community knew her and she knew everybody's name just the same. Um, but her community was not uh, all of Northeast St. Anne, which is what it ended up becoming. Uh, so that was, that was a lot more impressive in terms of, wow, you know all these people's names and, and who like was related to them and how their family tree works and, and who was sick the other day, are they okay now, who needs help for school? Like she knew all of that and that became very impressive because it's like before it was just, you know, she knows everybody and you know that she knows everybody and everybody knows her. Now it was just like, wow. Like, you really follow through on the details. So I've always been working on, in the background with candidates in St. Anne, in the entire parish of St. Anne. So I've had the exposure to politics. I had the exposure to politics. Um, the candidate for this constituency, this particular constituency at the time was Michael Bill Navis. And he resigned because he had a young family and his business, he, um, he was concentrating on really building his business at the time. And he stepped down. I was asked by the party to hold the constituency together, so to speak, until a replacement candidate was found. However, in that time, a by-election was announced. I was working the constituency and I suppose the rest is history. It was a defining moment. She won what was then a People's National Party stronghold by 500 votes. It was a period of intense campaigning and it would be remiss of me if I didn't put on record my gratitude to Mr. Siago for the support that he put behind me. He was everything to me in that campaign. He was my mentor, my guidance counselor, my father. He was everything to me. He made sure that I ate, he made sure that I was up on time, and, and he made sure that I was out there. And it, regardless of whatever hesitations he might have had at the beginning of the announcement, they were all dispelled, I believe, within three days of working with me when he saw the connection that I had with the people. The Jamaica Labour Party's leadership in St. Anne was transformed by her period of office. She loved people and spent a lot of time with them. Her stewardship in Northeast St. Anne transcended political boundaries. The love the people of St. Anne had for her saw her easily staving off challenges for three consecutive terms. <laughs> Shaheen Robinson held ideals of collective effort, full employment, a managed economy, affordable housing, and had big dreams of collaborative efforts in developing projects for the benefit of all in the parish of St. Anne. For an example, persons who have kidney problems here, they have to travel to Kingston or Montego Bay. There is not a dialysis centre at the St. Anne's Way Hospital. Um, if we were to put a, establish a dialysis centre at the St. Anne's Way Hospital, persons from northwest, southwest, southeast and northeast would benefit from that. So that would be a good parish project. Um, Lisa, my colleague in southeast St. Anne, she might say that Fern Court needs to add another classroom or she might want to establish us another high school, seeing that 
um, Southeast St. Anne has one high school and it's Ferncourt High School. You know, we, uh, all of us can contribute to that. Um, Austin Lawrence down in Northwest St. Anne, he might have a project that he wants, a tourism project that can um, employ persons. All of us should contribute to that because we can employ people from all the constituencies. The strength of her beliefs gave her the courage to push on where others might have given up. Mrs. Robinson represented the urban rural constituency of Northeast St. Anne, which includes Ocho Rios for 19 years. She was tireless in her drive to develop tourism in St. Anne. A woman of substance and dignity, she was also relentless in her drive of promoting the rights of women. She held several positions in government, including Minister of State in the office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for local government in 2007. She was Minister of State in the Minister of Transport and Works in 2011. In 2016, she was appointed Minister of Labor and Social Security. As Minister, she demonstrated respect for workers and did all she could to transform and empower Jamaicans. Members of the public, I'm talking to members of the public, I want to bring to your attention that there are many unscrupulous persons pretending to be agents of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Let me emphatically state that the Ministry does not charge for its services. I urge everyone that if a job offer is too good to be true, it probably is not true. Please do not be scammed. The Ministry continues to place great emphasis on human capital development. For many persons, benefits derived from this ministry represents a lifeline, a transition from poverty to prosperity. During 2018-2019 financial year, PATH, or flagship social intervention program, disbursed over $5.3 billion to over 130,000 families or 340,000 beneficiaries. Beginning in June 2019, PATH benefits were increased by an average of 17%. Mr. Speaker, in September 2018, the Ministry introduced the PATH Back to School grant for each child registered in school. This grant will continue with over $500 million projected to be spent in the 2019-20 financial year. As promised last year, we will facilitate direct ele electronic transfers of benefit payments commencing with the August 2019 payment. This will represent a saving on both sides as well as being more discreet and convenient for the families. Mrs. Robinson constantly benchmarked policies and practices at the Ministry of Labor against international standards while remaining sensitive to local needs. We must enable persons with disabilities to take their rightful place in our society. Need I remind you that we are putting the ministry in the palms of our citizens' hands. Mr. Speaker, honoring the right to education for children with disabilities is important to the Ministry of Labor. Children with disabilities have a special place within the world of our ministry as they have at least two areas of social vulnerability by age and by functionality. Over the past year, the Early Stimulation Program has facilitated the transition of 100 children with special needs into mainstream and special education schools. 140 children with disabilities were given a new lease on life with assistive aids such as specialized wheelchairs, hearing aids, and walkers. 1,715 children received therapy treatment through the community-based intervention program for children with disabilities to enhance their physical and emotional health. Let's, uh, let, let us emphasize abilities, not disabilities, of our very special children. She reveled in Jamaica's culture. and championed the preservation of Jamaica's heritage. She also advocated for national hero Marcus Garvey's criminal record 
to be expunged. Shaheen Robinson, Member of Parliament, St. Anne Northeast. The constituency that I have the privilege to represent is a very important constituency because our first national hero, the right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey, was born in this parish. His boyhood home, where he grew up, is in St. Anne's Bay on Marcus Garvey Way. The reason I'm talking to you today is because an online petition has been started for the expungement of his criminal record for mail fraud in the United States of America. I believe that it is incumbent on every Jamaican who can sign, who has access to computer, to log on to the website and it is justice number four Garvey, justiceforgarvey.org. She was forced to curtail her activities in 2019 when her health began to deteriorate. She continued to appear in public, perhaps most notably when she appealed to employers and workers to work together to weather the effects of the coronavirus COVID-19. Workers are the most important part of any organization and they must be given all the necessary information, tools that they require to ensure that they can utilize the best safety and health practices. During this period, workers might be required to be quarantined or isolated for an extended period. In these instances, we are recommending to our employers that you exercise discretion beyond the provision of the Holiday with Pay Act 1974. We are also imploring employers to consider making use of the provisions under the Flexi Work Arrangement 2014 in order to ensure that where possible, staff can work from home, creating far less risk factors. I believe that as a nation, we have a responsibility to work together for a healthy and safe work environment. Shahini Robinson died on May 29, 2020. I'm still in a bit of denial as to <laughs> the whole situation at hand with her being dead because up to the last minute on Friday, May 29th, I thought she would bounce back because that is the personality that she had. She was resilient. She bounced back from every situation. So knowing that she had cancer and knowing that it is stage four because it was breast cancer and it, and it had spread, the way how she spoke to us about that cancer, you would think that she would live forever with it. <laughs> like a cold, something like that. So even when I saw her not looking so well and so on, I, I really thought she would have bounced back. Because every opportunity that she, she got to go back to her people and to show her support for them, she would have done that up to the very end. It's only in the last month when she was home and she did the last chemotherapy and she was very, very sick, ill at that time, um, that she didn't leave and try to make any attempts to go on the road to, to meet with our constituents or to, to do any form of public service. And that is a, a bit heartbreaking for me because there was no transition in my mind as to what next. And the illness for me was a background thought. I didn't think that it would should succumb to it any at all. She was just so strong to the very end. And I think her herself, don't, I mean, if we can even say that, I don't think she knew that this would be the outcome until the penultimate moment. Because she was always upbeat about where she was going. And I thought she would be living until at least 70, minimum, the three scores and 10, based on her attitude. and how she handled that disease with, with, with um, modesty and with grace. It's like, it took away this thing of what I know cancer to be, based on how she handled it. During this, this time, a friend of mine from Knox reached out to, to express his condolences, and he said to me that she was the auntie that everybody needed. And when I, when I read that, that is when I started to break down because she was definitely the aunt that everybody needed. And if, if I can tell you, my mother died when I was seven years old from cancer as well. And 
my aunt, Auntie Shane, took up the mantle. She took care of us, took us to school, take us back. She filled in. Nobody would understand the level of care that she had given to us. People would wonder, why do you call her Auntie Shaini? She's your mother. Why do you call her Auntie Shaini? I said, but she's my aunt. What is it about why this aunt takes such a special interest in you? And at that time, I wasn't thinking that way. It's going out into the world that I now understand her true value. That lady took care of us like no other, better than person's parents. I know persons who were at high school with me who had both their parents alive and they stayed there every third weekend. Nobody picked them up. Nobody was there to represent them at sports day or fun day. But my Auntie Shane was always there. And I can tell you another story. I remember when I was doing my SBA in 1999, I needed some materials to get my, my Principles of Business SBA done. And at that time, we could only give message, almost like a Chinese telephone type of thing. I had to tell my friend from school to call her when she gets home to tell her that I needed this or whatever things I needed. And she was sick that day and she drove in her 60s, you know, she was so sick when she came, I was so sorry for her. She came and brought the materials that I needed to do, the, the, the principles of business, SBA, at about nine in the night. She was so sick, but she said, that I know you need it and you have the deadline of tomorrow. I had to come and bring it for you. And that is just one of many of the stories that this beautiful lady did for us. I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, I could give you a million stories as to how good she was, but I can tell you that she was an aunt like no other. I don't think no one will ever have a person like her again. She's, she's a different type of aunt. She's a mother, she's a father. You know, she's, she's whatever you want when you need her to be. Never left us alone, never left us standing. So it's a... It's a, it's a loss beyond any other loss because I recently lost my father and I can tell you. And people express their condolences and everything. And, but you see, when my aunt passed, that is when persons were very, very, very touched by, by everything because everybody who knows me knows my auntie Shaini. They probably don't know my father as much as they know her because she jumped around and she was a maternal figure. She got everything done without a complaint or a murmur. Shaheeni Robinson was a politician's politician. She rose above the cut and thrust that often framed the precincts of parliament. She used charisma, statecraft, a can-do attitude and a basic decency to bolster supporters and win over opponents. Few politicians have exercised such dominance during their term in office. Few politicians have attracted such strength of feeling from within and outside of their party. You will meet some persons in life and they demonstrate traits or characteristics of another person. And you will say that that person is like that person. Make no mistake, there was no two Shaheeni Robinson. She was a unique person in her own right. And I would have interfaced with her at the Ministry of Labor, mostly. And in my mind, I consider Shaini to be one of the most friendliest ministers of labor. One of the most friendliest ministers of labor. In terms of her personality, in terms of how she would have interacted in the midst of a dispute, how she would relate to the employer, and how she would relate to the workers, and how she would relate to the trade unions. Mr. President, one of the things I appreciated about her is that most of the time she speaks, she speaks promoting the well-being and the safety and health of the workers. And it is no doubt in my mind 
That is why today we are dealing with, in the parliament, the occupational safety and health legislation. I commend her for bringing that piece of legislation that has been languishing for decades to the nation's parliament. The other thing I want to commend her on is that for years, we would have spoken about having a division of the Industrial Disputes Tribunal in the West. And everybody, every minister spoke about it and spoke about its intent and its promise. Shahini Robinson made that a reality. She decided that workers in the West no, don't have no need to come to Kingston because Kingston alone was not Jamaica. One of the other things is that, you know, she promoted knowing what she did as a political representative in winning that seat in St. Anne. I believe it became her nature to promote the rights of women. And by doing so, if you look at the structure and the divisions of the tribunal now, the chairman of Western Division of the Tribunal is a woman. The chairman of the Industrial Disputes Tribunal is a woman. There are more women representing the panels of the tribunal in history, and we owe that to Shahini Robbins. I pledge to her that I would work to make sure that the Disabilities Act that we passed in 2014 be realized, and in different ways, I was working with her to make sure that the legislation be brought to fruition. The law requires that um, the appointed day be set by the minister, but in order to have the effective day of the legislation uh, set, a number of things had to be done, including the drafting of codes of practice to help prevent discrimination against persons with disabilities. And because of my commitment to ensuring that this was realized, I, you know, the government had advertised for uh, the, a consultant to complete and draft and complete the codes of practice for persons with disabilities, employment, and I was successful in the bid. But I said to her, Minister, you won't have to extend this contract because I'm going to finish it in time for you to set the effective date because I am working with you on the realization of that particular objective. And it was completed in time and submitted uh, to her. But there were other codes of practice that had to be put in place as well. And that has held up the process. But I know that she was extremely committed to realizing that objective of getting the, uh, uh, the, the, the appointed day set for the legislation. She was a woman of courage. To follow Mr. Siaga's advice and to run in a strong PNP seat took courage. And I respect her for that courage. I was down there at the by-election and I could tell you from morning to evening the PNP was losing. A JLP juggernaut that we only saw in the 1980 was at work. She became MP and she has served in the parliament ever since that time in 2001.
I speak about courage, Mr. President, because even in our illness, if you didn't know, as some of us did, that she was ill, sitting where St. Marison is now, you'd never know that she was in pain and she was suffering. When, during the COVID, she took out that video to appeal to employers and workers to work together, that took a lot of courage. Took a lot of courage. If you look behind the makeup, you could see that she was in physical pain. But she felt she needed to be there for the people of the country and the workers. And I respect her as a woman of courage. The staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade and the members of the Jamaica Foreign Service treasured their opportunities to work with Minister Shahini Robinson and are honored to have borne witness to her effortless blend of strength, poise, and humility in pursuing her mission for Jamaica's progress and for the enhanced social welfare and well-being of her fellow human beings everywhere. They asked that I convey prayers for her strength and for strength, sorry, and healing for her family, friends, and colleagues in this time of sorrow, and hope that this small testament to her character will provide some comfort in the days and ahead. They ask that warm memories of all that she brought to life be a source of inspiration to us all in the years ahead. Mr. President, Jamaica has lost a champion for safer working environments and for labor market reforms. The Labour Party has lost a true patriot and a defender of democracy who fought an excellent fight. And the people of Northeast St. Anne have lost their queen and shining star who stood with and for them since 2001 with her victory in that unforgettable by-election. I close with two Bible verses, Mr. President, because if you knew Shahini, you also know she knew her Bible. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Luke 14, 11. And therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. From Colossians 3, verse 12. Shahini. Elizabeth Fakuri Robinson, may your soul rest in peace and may your good works stand as a symbol of the life you lived. What struck me most of all about Shani Robinson was this quality of goodwill that she extended to all. She did it in her personal relations. Her personal relationships were not restricted to people of her own political affiliation. She extended it. And her political outreach in her community was driven by a sense of service to community. I would go on occasion to funerals of the most celebrated and distinguished members of the People's National Party in St. Anne. And Shahini Robinson would be there, paying her tribute, accepted by all, and recognized as being of her own affiliation, but accepted as part of the community of that parish, the communities of that parish. And in the parliament, in the parliament, she was able with, with, in her own inimitable style, to maintain good relations with everyone. And my great concern now is who will restrain the member from Southwest 
Club Southwest said Catherine. Because she was a very positive influence in, on him. And I, and I would like, in passing, to extend our sympathies and condolences to you on the passing of your brother. It's, it's a hard blow to take in a time like this. But Shaheen's passing reflects the possibilities that exist for politics, the possibilities that exist for the parliament, that we can always remember that despite differences, we can express them respectfully to each other, that despite the interests which diverge and which separate us, we can pursue these interests in keeping with the highest traditions of respect for each other and for the country and the parliament which we serve. Her example is worthy of emulation across the generations. I'm sure I will not be the only one to say this, but it is as if Shahine had a photographic memory that if she read your name, or if you told her her name, or your name, she would never forget it. Uh, I have had the opportunity to walk with her, to tour the town of St. Anne's uh, uh, Bay with her, and Otrius, and she would know everyone by name. The taxi man passing and saying, hi, Miss Shiny, hi, mommy. And she would say, walk on, so and so, walk on. She knows everybody by name and then of course she would then tell you their story oh you know this one mother so and that one live over so she took constituency organization and constituency representation seriously her mantra was if we are going to be good politicians that's how we have to know our people she lived her sage words and would often say, if you don't go into politics to serve, it doesn't make any sense. You have to want to serve the people to make a difference in the lives of the people. Shahini truly inspired me with her belief that if you go through life and you are not helping people, then life is not worth living. And She would also say it's a sin to say no when you can say yes. And I've witnessed that firsthand, Mr. Speaker. I've witnessed it in not just the care and love for her constituents, but the care and love for her family in taking care of her brother, who was also my friend who passed, Peter Fukuri. She exemplified dignity and deportment, always composed, quick to build up, no tearing down. Even in the end, as she was overtaken by illness, she met the ultimate challenge with the same quiet strength which characterized a selfless life of service. I would like my aunt, my auntie Shagini, my faith, to be remembered as a person who genuinely cared for people. She was a humanitarian first, a politician second. The politician calling was the platform for her to get out her humanitarian work. She has always helped people, and I want everyone to remember her as the loving, caring person that she was. She has set a stage, and I implore upon all other politicians to follow. Care about your people first and then think about the politics later because everything will come if you care about the people and you take care of them as you should and you represent them as you should. For me, her legacy is her kindness and treating people with love. Empathy. Empathy is a big deal uh, that she demonstrated because, I mean, she might not be in the situation of the people that she was helping, but she could surely understand it and help them through it and do what she could, even if, you know what I mean? Uh, 
I think that's missing now in the world for the most part. Uh, and I think if more people embraced it or learned it, uh, we would be having a much better time. Thank you.